morning as we continue in our study in the book of Job. Uh, Today we're going to be looking in Job chapters 38 through 41 uh, with a focus on chapter 40. So if you got your Bible, just open your Bible up to Job 38, starting in verse 1, and we'll begin there. Uh, But in the meantime, we want to pray before we begin. Uh, As I lead you in prayer, I would invite you in the place where you're listening today that, that you would raise up to the Lord any concerns that may be on your heart this morning. God is there with you just as He is here with me right now. And don't be afraid ever to bring things to the Lord that may be troubling your heart because He can help you. He can do all things. Let's pray. Father, we praise Your name. We thank You, Lord, for this day that You've given us, this this day that we've been able to come together and and to open Your Word together. Lord, we we thank You for this uh, great uh, technological breakthrough that we have that allows us to to actually be physically located in, in, in more than one place and, and be able to join together in, in lifting up our praise to You and, and to listening to Your voice as we open Your Word and read from Your Word. Lord, we ask that You would guide our hearts. Lord, help us to understand these passages and Lord, help us to know how You would have us to apply these timeless truths in our lives. Lord, we have many that we pr- are praying for today that... Uh, concern us, Lord, many who are ill. Lord, we ask you for healing. We know that, Lord, that you're able to do all things, uh, and we would, we would ask for your miraculous healing in, in each one of those situations. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would comfort our hearts and the hearts of those whom we, we love in the situations, the difficult situations in life. Lord, we always ask that your will be done. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, now looking, looking back at our study so far, we're, we're 37 chapters into the study, and, and throughout the entire dialogue with his friends, Job's friends had argued that Job's only relief from his suffering would come after his repentance of his sins against God. Job responded that he would humbly like to discuss with God the real reasons for his losses and suffering. Uh, He couldn't understand it completely either, why these things fell upon him. But Job realized that he, in order to do that, he would need a mediator or an arbitrator between himself and God in order to properly accomplish such a discussion. And we see him mention that Two times, first time in Job 16, and the second time in Job chapter 31. Now we're coming down to chapter 38. And God is about to grant Job this awesome request that he has desired. However, (laughs) Job will find out in their face-to-face meeting that it's not going to go exactly the way that Job had pictured that meeting. Ready to confront God for all the suffering he had endured, Job found himself being instead confronted by God. Let's look at Job 38, verses 1 and 2. The question there that God has for Job is, would you counsel me? Job? Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? The symbolism of God's revelation to Job is significant. God spoke to Job out of the whirlwind. You remember that Job's ten children had been killed in a tornado. God breaks through to people through through and out of the storms of life. 
at our lowest times. Only God can bring peace and hope to us. In verse 1, God identifies Himself with His personal and covenant name, the Lord. And this is for a purpose. Okay, God's speaking to Job, and He's wanting to tell him important things that he needs to understand during these times of trouble. God identifies himself with his personal and covenant name. In the text, you see there, it is the Lord, and Lord is in all capital letters. That means that the Hebrew word behind the Lord is the Hebrew form of God's covenant name. That is the Hebrew word spelled Y-H-W-H in English, using English lettering. Uh, It is pronounced Yahweh, and it means I am. God reveals Himself in this personal way only to persons with whom He has a covenant relationship. After the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C., the Jewish people refused to audibly speak God's name out of reverence for the third of the Ten Commandments, which says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. So so they would not even speak it, even when they were reading directly out of Scripture. Now, God reveals Himself in this personal way only to persons with whom He has a covenant relationship. And when, so when the Jewish people trying to, trying to, repair their relationship with God after their, their, their being taken into captivity by Babylon and now returning, when they would audibly read the Scripture, the Jews of that day would pronounce God's name as Adonai, meaning my Lord. Then many, many Almost 2,000 years later, when William Tyndale was translating the Hebrew Old Testament into English around 1526 A.D., no one knew the proper pronunciation of God's name because uh, the Jews hadn't been pronouncing it for, for so long, about 2,000 years. So the translators of the first English Bible place the vowel sounds of Adonai between the German equivalent consonants of God's name, and those German equivalent are J-H-V-H. And that's how they got the pronunciation of the, of the name as Jehovah. And so beginning in the King James Bible, which would come in 1611, God's personal name was translated into English in print as THE LORD in all caps. The important thing to know here is that the word means I am. God is the eternally self-existent one. He has no beginning and He has no end. He simply is. And because of his covenant with Job, God was going to intervene in Job's life and help him to deal with his loss. Job said in Job 31, 1 through 4, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? For what is the allotment of God from above and the inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is it not destruction for the wicked and disaster for the workers of iniquity? Does he not see my ways and count all my steps? Okay, so what, we're, what Job allows us to see here is that he had a, a, a good grasp on 
the damage to our relationships with God that's caused by our personal sin. That God will not, will not involve Himself in sin in any way whatsoever. And, and so we see as Job explains these things, we're, we're beginning to understand better and better what, what Job understands about God, and God now is going to show Job even more insights into who he is and his relationship with us and under our covenant of faith with him. So now in chapter 38, God summons Job for the hearing that Job had requested. And Job did not earn this arbitration with God, but God granted it by His grace to this person who was in covenant relationship with Him. Now let's look at verse 2 in chapter 38. God said this, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? The Lord asked Job a rhetorical question. God clearly knew Job, but Job had grossly overstepped his bounds with God. The Hebrew word for counsel that's used here by God points to God's exclusive sovereignty and His omniscience, His knowledge of all things, and His sovereignty for for running His world, His creation, the way that He sees fit. Job's unknowing assertions cast a dark shadow over the light of God's revelation of Himself. Now let's go on down to to verse 5 and looking more at this conversation between Job and God. In verse 3, first of all, Job says, now prepare, I mean God says to Job, God said to Job, now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. The Lord called upon Job to prepare to answer him like a man. The literal Hebrew that's beside, behind that says, God said, gird up your loins like a man. Now this is a picture of how a man in the ancient world hiked up his outer robe when he's about to run or be involved in a strenuous activity like going to battle. He would use a cord that was around the the lower hem of his robe, and he would pull the cord up and tie the the lower part of his garment so that it would hang above his just above his knees. Until now, Job had challenged God, accusing him of injustice and in, in, in allowing these things to happen in his life. The the picture of Job girding up his garments announced the reversal of the roles between he and God. God would assume his rightful place as judge over all of humankind, and he would interrogate Job instead of the other way around. God says in a a satirical fashion, and you shall answer me. God did not need any information that Job could possibly supply to him. God knows all things about all people. He knows even our hearts. God is alone is omniscient and all-knowing from eternal to eternal. So God begins with a barrage of questions all illustrating Job's lack of power and wisdom in comparison to God. So, Let's go back to verse 5 in chapter 38, and let's read on through verse 12. God asks, in verse 4, He said, Where were you 
when I laid the foundations of the earth. Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, when I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors, when I said, this far you may come, but no farther, and here your proud waves must stop, have you commanded the morning since your days begin and caused the dawn to know its place? Okay, now we're getting a gist of what God's asking. If we come on down to verse 31, we see some even more amazing things that God asked. God said to Job, Can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades? Now, Pleiades is the group of the seven closest and brightest stars in our night sky. It's just west of the, of, the, of the group of stars called Taurus. Okay, so he says, Can you bind the, cl the cluster of Pleiades or loose the belt of or Orion? He's, and we know the, the, the star group called Orion as well. Verse 32, can you bring out Maseroth? Now, Maseroth to the Jewish people was the Big Dipper. Can you bring out Maseroth in its season? Or can you guide the great bear with its cubs? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you set their dominion upon earth? God asked some very difficult questions that puts Job and you and I in our place. It puts us in a situation of absolute humility toward the Almighty, the Omniscient, and the Sovereign God who controls all of these things that He's pointing out. He created them all. He designed them all. He put them all in place. In verse 4 there, it says, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. God organizes these questions that He asks roughly according to the pattern of the creation narrative. Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3. Each of these questions is far, far beyond Job's or any man's understanding and capability. God moves prior to and well beyond human comprehension. God operates in realms far beyond human ability. The phrase, I laid the foundations of the earth, is, is figurative rather than literal. Even Job in Job 26.7 Recognize the fact that the earth is suspended in space and is already... He said that in Job 26, 7. He said, God stretches out the north over empty space and He hangs the earth on nothing. This statement declares the reality that God designed, surveyed, and constructed the planet without any assistance from any person. And God did this well before any human existed. God reminded Job and us that in the beginning, Genesis 1-1, not one of us was present. No human had yet been created. No person saw these great acts of God and no human assisted him. God is the Creator, and we are humans, and we are creatures placed on this earth according to God's purpose. 
Now let's come down to Job chapter 39. Beginning in verse 1. Do you know the time when the wild goats bear young? Or can you mark when the deer gives birth? Can you number the months that they fulfill? Or do you know the time when they bear their young? They bow down. They bring forth their young. They deliver their offspring. Their young ones are healthy. They grow strong with grain. They depart and do not return to them. Who set the donkey free? And who loosed the bonds of the onager? The onager is, is a, just a wild donkey, okay? And so God's point there, point there is, that, is that God knows all of these. He's controlling all of these things in, these, in the world, including the wild animals that He's placed. They, they do just fine without our help. They know how to live their lives. They know how to find food and water. They know how to birth their young. They know how to take care of their young. And they don't need our help. Because God is taking care of them. Job's inability to answer any one of these questions by God left him with a decision to make. Number one, Job could submit to God, trust in the Lord's wisdom in all things, believing that He rules the world justly. Or, number two, Job could continue his complaint against God, asserting himself to be wiser than God. This would be an open rebellion against God's sovereignty and it would be blasphemy against God. It, was, it would be claiming the rights and abilities for ourselves, for Himself, that only belong to God. Okay? And in that sense, it's blasphemy. So, Job had a choice. What's he going to do now? So let's come down to chapter 40, and let's look at verses 1 through 5. And in that passage, God asked Job, Do you correct me, Job? Verse 1 through 2. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. Now God landed a final question to the end of his speech. God asked Job to justify his heart's intent in approaching him the way he did. Whenever the line between the Creator and the creation is blurred, error and idolatry are the result. We see this in the actions of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. As humans, we are made in God's image and likeness. He is not made in our image. We are made in His. Many missteps in theology are on account of the implicit idea that God must act as we would act. No, 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 no. You got the shoe on the wrong foot. The other possibility that causes problems is that Humans can fully understand the ways of God where they have not been revealed to us. And that is false also. And we make bad assumptions when we go down either one of those two theological paths. And it causes huge problems. God reveals Himself to us in human terms. Yes. Because it's, it's what we, where we live. It's what we know. Okay? But, 
We must not think that our limited understanding is the ultimate reference point for God's action. Look at the Hebrew word that's used in those two verses. Uh, in, in my translation, it's translated the Almighty. Okay? It is really the Hebrew word Shaddai. This name carries with it the meaning of the overpowerer. The overpowerer. The one who is able to overpower anything. As Jesus put it, with God, all things are possible. God is the El Shaddai. He is the one in whom all things are possible. And this is the title, the name that God gives himself in his description here to Job. This reminds us that it is impossible for anyone or anything to keep God from accomplishing his sovereign decrees. God's desire can meet anything that he desires. It also reminds us that no one of God's creatures has any right to question God's decisions, nor to try to do God's job for him. No person is capable of doing the things that God does. No person can fully understand God's ways nor His means to accomplishing those ways. God then demanded a response from Job, saying, He who rebukes God, let him answer it. Now this is interesting that God uses this word rebuke the Hebrew word that's translated rebuke buke, means a sharp criticism. Job has no right to criticize God. Neither do we. In verses 3 through 5, let's proceed. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice. But I will proceed no further. Knowing Job's desire to confront him, God revealed himself as the omniscient, the almighty, to humble Job and to quiet his mouth. In other words, God set Job straight before he began to address his perceived unfairness in receiving the suffering that he had. In verse 4, the first words out of Job's mouth were, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? The Hebrew word for vile Listen to this. The Hebrew word for vile means small, insignificant, unworthy, nothing. And all of this with an attitude of disrespect. Now remember, Job called himself vile. Okay? Job, by using this word, shows he was completely humbled before God realizing that he had neither the knowledge, the intellect, nor anything near the standing to answer God. God's statement had left Job with really nothing to say other than, I lay my hand over my mouth. Job rightly recognized that that these matters were far beyond his understanding. In fact, these matters were far beyond the reach of any human's power or knowledge or any creature standing before God. It is clear that Job realized his ignorance in these matters 
and his mistake in suggesting he might in any way rebuke God. Job offered his apology and his repentance to God in saying, Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. Job had previously thought that he would put God in his place, but it was God who set Job in his proper place. Now notice that this is a this is a, a statement of repentance. What he meant by in saying I will proceed no further is he meant I am going to turn around. I am going to stop going down the path that I'm going down and I'm going to turn and I'm going to go the other way. I am going to come towards you, God, and, and stop walking away from you. Now let's look at verse number 2. In relation to the Almighty God, Job rightly describes himself as small and insignificant. Insignificant is actually the translation that's in the Christian Standard Bible. It's, it's not necessarily wrong for us to question God as He works out His will in the world, and particularly in our individual life. God wants us to have a dialogue with Him. What is wrong is that unless we become significantly... It, what becomes wrong is when we become significant, sinfully adamant in seeking that God justify His actions in our lives. We can't go there. We can't come to God and we can't be, insist that God justify what He's done in our lives. Human beings have many questions about how God rules this world. But we have no justification for demanding answers for circumstances that we do not that we do not deem appropriate. We have lots of questions, but we, we have to be really careful about our demanding answers. Oftentimes we see in our world our children will ask us questions of why when they're told to do something. That's a word that comes easily out of a two-year-old's mouth. Why? There's nothing necessarily wrong with that unless the child's questions are revealing a heart of rebellion or disrespect for their parent or when their actions become disobedient to the parent. As Christians, we must remember that God is our Creator. He is our Father, and we are His creatures, and we are His children. Furthermore, we did not know enough about the creation to understand all of God's ways. Only God knows the beginning from the end, and we must learn to trust His wisdom in working out His purpose. Most times, our proper response to God's work is not to question Him, but to acknowledge and submit to His will in the matter. And that's really hard to do with things in life that hurt really badly. I know that. I've been down that road, as you have as well. But we have to always pray with the understanding and the belief that God's will is always best. In light of the fact that we don't know all the circumstances. We, do, we don't know anywhere near all the circumstances. Okay, now let's come down to verses 6 through 9 in chapter 40. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. 
Would you indeed annul my judgment? Would you condemn me that you may be justified? Have you an arm like God? Or can you thunder with a voice like His? Wow. This, it, this, now God is really coming down to the crux of the matter. Do we have any right to question God's justice and God's judgment? Even after Job's admission of insignificance and his decision to quiet his mouth, God continued. God launched into a second speech which was directed squarely at Job and intended to search Job's heart. At this point, it is clear that God has it is clear that God has not oh, I'm sorry. It is clear that God was not done. Okay? God's not done talking to Job. There's more things God knows our heart. Okay? And he knew that Job needed to be to learn a more full lesson in this. And the Lord answered Job another time out of the whirlwind. The call from God was for Job, again, to prepare himself like a man. He, God's saying, this is going to be kind of hard for you to hear and hard for you to take, but get all of yourself. I will question you and I want you to answer me. So God asked, would you indeed annul my judgment in the matter. Is any person worthy to question the judgment of God? Job knew how it felt to be questioned and judged by other people. Even people that he thought he knew very well and that he loved, his friends. All of these had drawn the wrong conclusions about his personal and private circumstances and his relationship with God. Can any of us present our own purpose over that of God's purpose? Now the tables were turned. And God was showing Job that he had overextended his own perceived judgments about the hidden purposes of God in his life. The Lord did not specifically speak of Job's complaints, but neither did he reprove Job for wrongdoing. Notice that? God still had not told Job why these things happened to him. Okay? God was not ready to do that. But at the same time, he didn't tell Job it was because of your sinfulness. God's not saying that either. But anytime we have a conversation with God, regardless of the circumstances, there is much for God to teach me. I need to be listening. Okay. God did rebuke Job for the audacity of believing he could dispute with God as an equal. As he unrelentingly question Job, we begin to understand that God's purpose is to demonstrate that He alone has the wisdom and the power to sovereignly decree what happens in the lives of His creatures, of you and I, of people. Only God can do that. This becomes clear from God's reference to his arm, okay, which is a metaphor for God's power, providentially deployed in human history. God says, have you an arm like God? In the Bible, other places in the Bible, the arm of the Lord is anthropomorphic language and gives a vivid image of God's power, in, especially in salvation and in God's judgment of us. Okay? This is so important to see that that, that 
the power and the authority of God falls in, especially in those two arenas, in our salvation and our judgment by God. Well, he's going to speak some more about that. It's not only God's arm, but also God's voice that reverberates like thunder. God asks of Job, can you thunder with a voice like his? This is evident also in Psalm 29, verses 3 through 4, where we read, the voice of the Lord is above the waters. Now, we've all seen waters, Uh, maybe you've seen a lake, a large lake, like Lake Mead, okay? But you know, when you go to the ocean and you look out across the ocean, you see a body of water like no others. As far as your eye can look, you cannot see the end of the water, okay? Now look what it says right after that in Psalm 29, 3 through 4. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is above the vast water, the water of the oceans, the voice of the Lord in power, the voice of the Lord in splendor. He is above the oceans and everything that's going on in the ocean. Both of these images of God's arm and His voice are utilized to evoke visions of God's majesty and His unrivaled power. God's purpose was to put Job in his proper place. As believers, we must be careful to avoid viewing God as unfair or unjust. Again, it's important to note in this passage that God did not explain the meaning of Job's suffering. He did not give a reason for it. This is a mystery in God's work in the world. You know, we talked about that last week, that in many things that happen in this world, we don't know the reasons why. God does not reveal them to us. They are a mystery, okay? This reminds us that our response to God, to God's will, even in suffering, does matter. We must learn to trust God and continue trusting Him, even when we cannot grasp His plan and His purposes. Now let's come down to chapter 40, verse 10. And God asked the greatest question of all. He asked Job, Job, can you save yourself? He says, and if you think you can, look in verse 10. Then adorn yourself with majesty and splendor and array yourself with glory and beauty. Disperse the rage of your wrath. Look on everyone who is proud and humble him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low. Tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together. Bind their faces in hidden darkness then I will confess to you that your own right hand can save you. God says, in other words, if you can do these things, then I believe you can save yourself. Again, it becomes clear that Job could not answer God's question. When it comes to justice on earth, Job was making claims about things that were far beyond what he was able to comprehend or accomplish. The same goes for us. God is unrivaled in power and majesty. In comparison, Job and you and I are insignificant. Mankind, the crown of God's creation, according to God's word, pales in comparison to our Creator, God. Verse 10, it tells us that in all of Scripture, 
Only God is declared as being adorned with majesty and splendor and clothed with glory and beauty or or honor, as it says in the Christian Standard Bible. We see this in Psalm 47, in Psalm 93, in Psalm 96, and many other psalms. Yet here, God challenged Job. Could he adorn himself with such qualities? If he could adorn himself like God, then he could act like God and execute justice on the wicked. Then he goes to that question, justice on the wicked, in verses 11 through 13. God continued his challenge, and he told Job to look on everyone who is proud and humble him, and to tread down or trample, as in the Christian Standard Bible, the wicked, and hide them in the dust together, and bind their faces in hidden darkness. Now, this is an illusion not illusion, but allusion to God's final judgment. He doesn't say it's God's final judgment, but he's alluding to that, okay? This is an allusion to God's final judgment against the person who refuses to follow the holy God in faith and rebels against the Lord with transgression and iniquity, as we saw in last week's lesson, okay? Verse 13, there's a word here that, we need, that has deep meaning in what God just said to Job. The Hebrew word that's translated dust is afar. It's the same word used by God in pronouncing the final judgment upon the serpent or Satan after the fall of Adam and Eve into sin in Genesis 3.14. There God pronounced to the serpent, you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Jesus said that Satan has already been judged by God. His final judgment has already occurred. And this is where it happened, right here. God judged Satan on the spot and to to tell him that he would eat dust all the days of his life is a, is a judgment of eternal damnation. Being separated from the holy God forever. This same Hebrew word, afar, is then used again in God's pronouncement upon Adam and Eve and all their descendants. Okay, uses the same word, but not in the same way. Look at this. There is a consequence to their sin that separates them from God. Okay, But for Adam and Eve, God said, dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Hence, in reference to people, this word is then often understood and translated as the grave. This is how it's translated in the Christian Standard Bible. Okay. God did not, however, pronounce the grave as being the final judgment upon Adam and Eve and all their descendants, like he had done for Satan. Instead, God had stated previously in Genesis 3.15, right after God stated the judgment for Satan, God promised to bring a greater one, a hope in which every human could trust and believe. The great one would not come through the seed of Adam, but through the seed of a woman. We see later in the fulfillment of this one that his father would be God himself. Also, God promised that this great one would bring a death blow to Satan in sin. God said he shall crush Satan's head. Therefore, for those people who refuse to believe and trust in the hope of the Lord 
through the blood sacrifice for their sins. Now you remember, in the, in the first week of our study in Job, we saw that Job believed he was placing his faith in the blood sacrifice for his sins, and he was teaching his children to do the same thing. That we must place our faith in the blood sacrifice for our sins to be forgiven of our sins. And if we will do that, God will forgive us. But if we choose not to place our faith and our trust in that blood sacrifice, God will, it says, God will imprison them in the grave forever. The New King James, New King James Version says, God will bind their faces in hidden darkness. Bind their faces forever in hidden darkness, separated from Him. Job, just like every other human being, is neither able to perform God's righteous judgment upon every single person, nor can he or she imprison them in the grave who refuse to believe and trust in the hope of the Lord, where the Lord is in all caps, God's covenant name, okay? Nor can he or she enable the believer who lives by faith in the Lord, again, Lord written in all caps, to live forever in the presence of the Holy God. Okay, now, let's, let's bring this down to a level that we understand today. For Christians who commit ourselves to lives of faith in the Lord, in all caps, the covenant name of God, the great I Am, the Christ, the Jesus, if we will commit ourselves to lives of faith throughout our painful journeys in this lost and dying world, we can hold our heads up and we can look toward the almighty and eternal hope of the living and holy God through His Son, Jesus. Do you see how God is painting this picture for Job? This picture of a repentance for sin and a life of faith in the sacrifice that He will provide through His Son, Jesus. Now we come down to chapter 40, verse 15. And, and God asked enough, some more questions of Job. He says, look at the, at the behemoth which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See, now his strength is in his hips and his power in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit his bones are like beams of bronze and his ribs like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword that will destroy him. And we can look at the world all around us every day and we see evidences everywhere of God's creative power. We can see His loving care and His provision for every creature that He has placed on this earth. We see creatures that are much more powerful than us, and we see creatures that are much more vulnerable to us, but God provides for each and every one of them. So much more so for you and I who are made in the image and the likeness of God, the crown of His creation. 
But each of us, each of us, are supremely loved and cared for by the Lord our God who came to earth clothed in human flesh and blood to provide the final and complete sacrifice for our sins through His death on the cross. Then He rose up from the grave to demonstrate His defeat of our sin and His power over death's hold on us, the grave. The grave does not have to be our eternal destiny. Yes, we must leave these corrupted bodies behind, but Jesus promises to us, the Son of God promises that He will provide resurrected bodies that will be able to live in His glory and His presence as the Holy God. Trust in Him and you will be forgiven. Trust in Him and you will be saved. Just as God told Job in verse, chapter 41 verses 1 through 34, God goes on and He says to Job, can you capture and tame Leviathan? Now we don't know who Leviathan is. We can tell by the description that he's a, an ominous sea creature okay, that lives in the sea. Is he a killer whale? Is he a great white shark? Is he, is he a megalodon, which, is, which are extinct today? We're not told. We know it's an awesome sea creature, though. He says, can you, can you tame the Leviathan with a hook or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? Can you put a reed through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make any supplications to you? Will he speak softly to you? Will he make a covenant with you? Will, he t will you take him as a servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bird? Or will you leash him for your, own, for your maidens? Will your companions make a banquet of him? Will they apportion him among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay your hand on him. And remember the battle and never do it again. Indeed, any hope of overcoming him is false. Shall one not be overwhelmed at the sight of him? No one is so fierce that he can dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand against me? That's God. Who can stand against God? God goes on and says in verse 11, Who has preceded me? that I should pay him. Everything under heaven is mine. And brothers and sisters, that includes me and that includes you. Everything under heaven belongs to the Almighty God. And we humble ourselves before Him. And we, and we realize that, that we must submit to His will in all things. We must accept Him and look forward to that day when we will stand in His presence in our resurrected bodies. And all of our sins will have been wiped away by our living by faith faith in His Son, Jesus, and the price that He paid, that we could not pay, that He paid for our sin. Let's close in prayer. Father, we praise You. Lord, we, we thank You for these amazing words that, that You speak to a man who, who lived 4,000 years ago. And those words that You speak to him are the same words that you would speak to us today as, as we stand in your presence, as we 
stand giving an account to you of our lives and our faith in you. Lord, we know the truth as you have spoken it in your word. Lord, you have moved our hearts to repent to you of our wrongdoings, to repent to you of our our heart that is not it that is still clouded and not quite clear of sinful thinking and simple understanding. Lord, we stand before you and illuminated and and made to understand the truth about our relationship and our walk with you. Lord, we turn from those things and we place our trust in you and your son that you have provided to pay the price for our sin. And Lord, we believe that that price is fully paid and that the day that we stand in judgment that our sins have been washed away by His shed blood on the cross, and that You have overwritten our sins with Your righteousness and the righteousness of Your Son. Lord, we stand before You thankfully, humbly, and asking, Lord, that You would go forward with us and walk with us and speak to us and guide us according to Your way. And Lord, enable us to accept your will in all matters as you see fit to judge. It's in Jesus' great name that we pray. Amen.